We encounter a topic today that is going to hit on an area of our lives that we probably end up having the highest hopes about, but end up with the greatest discouragements. What area would I be talking about where we have the highest hopes, but oftentimes end up the most discouraged? That topic, very simply, is Christian friendship. We might call it biblical discipleship. We might call it true fellowship. Other words used today to talk about Christian fellowship and Christian friendship is words you might hear when people say they just want to be a part of a church with a good community. Or we want to be somewhere that's authentic, transparent, intimate, close. Or we hear people say, I want to do life with other people. These are worthy, noble, godly desires God has designed us for relationships. Even the Trinity reflects closeness, unity, purity, strength between the Godhead. But when we use those words like depth, community, transparency, authenticity, do we have biblical definitions for those words? Do we define them the way God defines them? Do we really know what it means to have an authentic, godly, Christ-honoring, biblical friendship? Do we know what it means to have a biblical fellowship and community of believers? Solomon speaks about how sweet Christian friendships are and what a profound blessing they are in Proverbs 27.9. He says this, oil and perfume make the heart glad. So a man's counsel is sweet to his friend. Did you hear that? Good friendships, good counsel, people coming alongside you, us supporting one another is to result in a rewarding, enriching life. God's designed us and wants us to have sweet, flourishing friendships. Or Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times. Who doesn't want to have a friend that in the good, the bad, and the ugly, they are there for you? They will support you. They will encourage you. They will walk with you. Who out here doesn't want to say at all times that person is my friend? One of my favorite comments about friendship is from Samuel in 1 Samuel. The inspired author Samuel penning scripture gives us a window into the type of friendships and deep, close relationship God wants for us to have when he describes David and Jonathan. And in 1 Samuel 18, 3, listen to this language. Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. How could you love someone more than to describe you love them as your eternal soul? No deeper love could be found between two true believers. And so all this is true, beloved. God wants us to have friendships like that, relationships like that, discipleship like that. And if that's true, why is it then? We are often left longing in our hearts to have deeper friendship with other believers. Why is it that we can even be around lots of people in the church and still feel plagued with loneliness? What is that in us? Why does that happen? Well, I will tell you why. Sin. Not just sin in our hearts, though that's true, but sin in society, sin in our past, sin in the fact that we live in a cursed earth that makes labor hard, sickness frequent, and our weaknesses are ever-present, are they not? I jotted down a few other ways. Why and how Sin can make meaningful relationships so hard, even in the church. First, our society nurtures individualism and independence. The scriptures actually don't call us for individualism and independence. The scriptures call us to interdependence. In fact, in our passage today, we are going to be exhorted, pleaded with by Paul and his associates to depend on each other in our weaknesses. And yet our society tells us the greatest virtue you can have is to be able to stand alone. Second, sometimes people struggle 
and are strained in their friendships because they've tried, right? Some of you have tried and you've opened up your heart and you've been transparent and you've tried to move into close friendships. And unfortunately, in your vulnerability and transparency, people have hurt you. And so we as humans, we're not very good at being hurt and responding well. And so what do we do? We erect self-protecting high walls around our heart and make it almost impossible for people to climb those to actually know us. It's self-defense mechanisms. That hinders our friendships. Third, oftentimes we grow up in dysfunctional home life. That's a lot of years of practicing a bad approach to meaningful friendships. You know, the types of relationships that don't go any deeper than the surface. The family norm isn't transparency and vulnerability. In fact, that's frowned upon. Conflict never addressed biblically. So we get really good at keeping relationships on the surface because it's just less trouble anyways, right? Fourth, you know what plagues our friendships, even in the church? Laziness. Absolute laziness. We become relationally lazy. We want things to come to us with ease and convenience. I mean, think about it. We are a microwave oven, Starbucks on the go, iPhone app, Amazon delivery, direct pay, HEB pickup society. So the idea of working hard, spending time, being diligent, persevering, pursuing, being proactive to build deep, meaningful friendships, I mean, that's just too much work. Can I just order a deep relationship at the pickup window? Won't Amazon deliver me a friend? I have Prime. (laughs) This is just literally in the water of our society and we swim in it. And yet we are Christians, beloved. We are called by God, saved and added to his church. And so we're to be different from the world. And in fact, in our passage today, the apostle Paul, along with Silas and Timothy, is going to put upon us not just an exhortation, but a very burdened appeal, pleading with us to reconsider how we think about Christian friendship. Why don't you read the passage with me? 1 Thessalonians 5.14, the entirety of our time will be in this verse today. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with everyone. Beloved, you don't want to miss something here. This isn't just an exhortation or a command. This is that, but it comes like a burdened father speaking to his spiritual children. Notice the beginning of 14. We urge you. It's a pleading. It's an appealing. Paul could just tell us, go do this. But rather, he draws on his fatherly love and authority and says, dear Thessalonians, please listen to me. Consider this. I'm pleading with you and exhorting you that you need to think about your relationships and friendships in a way that's Christian. And when he does this and calls us to think about our relationships with one another, you'll notice he puts before us, if you look in verse 14, really three different spiritual conditions a person might find themselves in. If you look at 14, you could find yourself unruly. You could find yourself faint-hearted. You could find yourself weak. And then there's three, basically, prescriptions given. If you find someone unruly, faint-hearted, or weak, look at the text. To the unruly, you admonish. To the faint-hearted, you encourage. To the weak, you help. And then there's a summary statement at the end. Be patient in the process with all. But I ask you, is this passage really just about transactional interactions and counseling other people? Or is there something deeper going on here that we're being called to? I would contend there is. For example, how would you discover someone is unruly? How would you know they're faint-hearted? How would you know they're weak? I mean, do we walk into church on Sunday and everyone has an information bubble above their head and we go in and we're like, there it is, unruly. Go admonish that guy. Oh, she's faint-hearted. Oh, gonna go encourage her. Oh, there's three weak, weak ones over there. Let me go in the corner and help the weak. Of course we don't. Of course these aren't just on the surface types of things. 
the very idea that you have to understand these things before you help people speaks to something far more than just an event. This is a paradigm, beloved. This is a paradigm of biblical friendship. This is a paradigm of biblical discipleship. This is a paradigm, a process which unfolds that we are being called and sucked into this passage to say, if I'm really going to have meaningful, deep, abiding, formative friendships, I'm going to have to be the person that actually knows when someone's in sin and I need to admonish them. When someone's struggling and I need to encourage them. And when someone's weak and I need to come alongside them. This passage is so much more than just a one-to-one event and it's over. This is calling for a lifestyle of Christians in the church. And so he says, Thessalonian believers, I'm pleading with you. If you want healthy body life, if you want unity, if you want a love coming to your church, then you all need to be a part of this. And you notice it doesn't say, now the pastor needs to go do this. It says, brethren, everyone, brothers and sisters in Christ under the same father. So, as I told you, there's three spiritual conditions that are described. Why did Paul choose these three? Unruly, faint-hearted, and weak. Well, they may not be comprehensive in terms of every type of experience we have as a follower of Christ, but I can show you, as you'll see today, they do describe the moments in our life when we most need others to come alongside us. They do describe those moments in our life when we most need Christian friendship. And so that's why I think Paul chose these three areas. And so our outline will be the shape of the text. In that way, if you're taking notes, here's our outline. Three ways we care for the souls of our friends in body life. Three ways we care for the souls of our friends in body life. And I say friends because this is calling us into close range, face-to-face, life-on-life Fellowship with one another. Christian friendship. So the outline is three ways we care for the souls of our friends in body life. Body life is a term for the church and fellowship. So here's the first. Ready? Three ways. The first way you care for the souls of your friends in body life is this. If you discern a friend is unruly, admonish them. If you discern a friend is unruly, you need to admonish them. And if you want to jot down a description, I'm going to give you these throughout, for what an unruly person is, I call them the knowing but unwilling. The knowing but unwilling. Look at the text. We urge you, brethren, if you find someone unruly, look at what the text says, admonish them. And I call this person the knowing but the willing Because the very nature of being unruly unruly, and the call to admonish speaks to the idea that you're going to be helping someone and coming alongside someone that is not lacking information. They actually have the information. They're just being stubborn. So they're knowing the truth, but unwilling to respond to it. So what is unruly? Unruly, the the, the root of unruly is the, the Greek word tasso, and then it has a negation on the front. What does tasso mean? Tasso is a term that means to follow the rules or follow orders or be compliant. It's used in secular Greek to speak of a soldier that would be in line and that would follow orders and that would follow the rules and it would get behind the others and go the direction the commander told them to go. So with the negation on it, the unruly person is someone that hears the commands Here's what the commander says to do. Here's the direction they're supposed to go. And they decide to go the other way. Unruly. It's used in the scriptures in 2 Thessalonians 3.11 to speak about people who are being exhorted by other believers to stop being so stubborn in a particular area. What is that area? There was a group of believers in Thessalonica who would not work. They would not care for their family. They would not go get a job and provide even though they were capable of it. And they were going around the church causing all types of disruptions. So believers are told by Paul in 2 Thessalonians 3.11, find the person who's being stubborn, who won't respond to scripture, the unruly, and you need to go confront them, admonish them. So when we find someone who's being unruly. Here could be a summary statement of what we say about them. They may have excuses. They may tell you all the reasons why they're 
not doing this or not doing that, but here's what it is. You've found a brother or sister who you love, who over time that you spend with them, you're recognizing that the clear teaching of scripture is coming to their life and rather than bending their will and submitting to it, they become resistant. They don't wanna follow the rules of scripture. They don't wanna obey scripture. So what are we to do if we love them? Admonish them. What is admonish? Well, admonish, what are we to do to this person? It's a word that means instruction, but it's implying placing instruction in the mind, placing truth in the mind that they need to hear. And what's implied here is it's truth they already know, but they're choosing not to obey it. And so we are called in this context to admonish in this sense, and the word moves this way in the scriptures, we're called to move the word out to the idea of I'm going to admonish in terms of I'm going to warn you. I'm going to come alongside you. I'll be gentle and I'll be gracious, but I'm going to come to you and say, brother or sister, I know you know the scripture says that. I know you know what it teaches, but I'm watching your life and it seems as if a pattern, you're resisting scripture. And if over time they end up proving that's true, you're gonna come and say, brother or sister, you're in sin and you're disobeying God and that's dangerous stuff. For when we disobey God, he's a good, loving father and he will bring discipline until we comply, Hebrews 12. So it has the idea of coming alongside and speaking to an issue where you see a brother or sister in sin. Sounds like Proverbs 27, 6. The kisses of an enemy may be many, but faithful are the wounds of a friend, right? Now, let me say something about admonishment for some of you that are really excited about admonishment. (laughs) Some of you think you're experts in admonishment. You go around and think everybody has the bubble over their head that says admonishment. You're ready. You're ready to warn everybody. This should not be the first line of defense. Paul includes it as the first thing to deal with because it's the most dangerous. Someone caught in sin, unruly. They are knowing but unwilling. Nevertheless, our approach should always be biblical even when it comes to admonishment, which means... 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7, love is not suspicious. Love assumes the best. If we see a brother or sister we think may be in sin, we should first come with encouragements. We should come with questions. We should ask them about the area of their life and ask them how they're doing and assume that they're a believer that wants to respond to truth. Assume the Spirit's working in their life. This is what Christian love does. But if they prove to be Corinthian, They prove to be Galatian. They prove to be like the Hebrews or they prove to be like four of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. We may have to come to that brother or sister and say, I've tried to encourage you. I've prayed with you. I've tried to come alongside you. I've spent time with you. I've asked you about this. Now it's becoming evident. The fruit of your life is disobedience to scripture. I need to admonish you. This is dangerous for you. James 5, 19 to 20, listen to this. My brethren, if any of you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he's turned a sinner from the error of his ways and he will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Wow. Or how about Jude 22 and 23? Have mercy on some who are doubting and listen to this. Save others, snatching them from the fire. Meaning sometimes you gotta reach in when they're in the fire and your arms get burned, but you pull them out. Now, I ask you, how in the world could you ever obey that command if you had a surface approach to friendships? How could you ever be in someone's life at that level where you'd have an idea that there's even a pattern developing that shows they're unruly? You see, this is not just walk into church, have a transaction and move on. This is a call to life in God's people where we move amongst each other and we love each other and we serve each other and we speak truth to each other and we spend time with each other. And over time, patterns emerge where our brother or sister may need to be rescued in a season. And you want friends like this for you and you want to be this to other people. So what is assumed then is that we're in one another's lives actually talking about what's going on in our hearts. What's assumed is we're spending time with one another and talking about how the scriptures relate to our life. What's assumed is we're asking questions to see how our brothers and sisters are doing in certain areas because we love them. 
You cannot have a shallow approach to church life and live this text. So you say, Pastor, it's okay. I got it. I know exactly what to do. When I see a person in sin, I have a phone and I call you. (laughs) And then you go deal with them. Or I call one of the leaders. Anytime I see someone in sin, I am so concerned about it, I call right away. Well, I don't know if you've read that in the white spaces or what, but when I read the text, it just says, we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly. Wow. So this is the work we do for one another. Sure, you may need to call a pastor. Sure, he may need to be your first call, an elder or a pastor, if things get really difficult. Of course, but that is along with your job in their life because you love their soul, you'll do this. The only reason we're not going to be the type of people that wants to gently admonish when we see people in sin, dear brothers, it just, we just got to say what it is. We just love our own comfort more than we love their soul in that moment. You say, I just, I can't do that. I can't have friendships like that. Well, then you haven't learned Christian friendship. Because Christian friendship has within it this idea that I know I can stray and I need brothers or sisters to come alongside me so I don't wander. We help each other. What do you think a bunch of the letters of the New Testament were delivered by men to give people the truth who were starting to drift? I'll just tell you what Solomon says to people, so it's not me saying it. What Solomon says to people that don't want Christian friendships where we're in one another's lives like this, where we have to come along and gently admonish each other from time to time. Here's what Solomon said in Proverbs 12.1. Whoever loves discipline or correction loves knowledge. We like that part of it. But he who hates a reproof is stupid. I'll tell you what I tell my kids. They're allowed to use stupid as a word if they use it biblically. (laughs) They're not allowed to use stupid other ways, but they can use stupid biblically. And stupidity in the Proverbs is someone that knows what Scripture says and chooses not to do it. That's stupid. Sin makes you stupid. Proverbs 12.1 says, if you don't want the types of friendships where a brother has space, a sister has space, to maybe at your worst moments when you get a little bit unruly, come alongside and gently reprove you, then you're cutting yourself off from wisdom. This is life in the church. You say, that's so hard. Yeah, but we're forgiven at the cross. All our sins are paid for. These are just people trying to help us along the way. So, the first way in Christian friendship and fellowship in the church that we care for the the souls of our friends in body life is this. If you discern someone is unruly, they're knowing but unwilling, admonish them. Gently, be gracious, be kind, be spirit-filled, Galatians 6. Be gentle with them. Treat them how you'd want to be treated if you were being admonished, but admonish them because you love them and you care for them. And if it gets to the point where you find out you're wrong, you could say, I'm sorry. I, 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 this is the way I understood things. Help me understand this. I, I want to be an encouragement to you. I want to support you. I wouldn't want to overspeak. But if they are in sin, we need to help them because that's what we do in the church. We don't do that in the world. The world runs from those things. The world's conflict avoidant. The world avoids that. We would never do that. But we love each other in the church. We love each other's souls, so we do it. So the first way you love friends in the church is if they're unruly, you admonish them. Second, second way you care for souls that are your friends in, the, in body life is this. If you discern they're faint-hearted, encourage them. If you discern they're faint-hearted, encourage them. And if I called the first group the knowing but unwilling, we can call the faint-hearted here the striving but struggling. This is probably... Uh, representative of all of us in here on a regular basis. The striving, but struggling. What do we do if we find a brother or sister striving to serve the Lord, but struggling and stumbling? What should be the way we minister to them? It's not put our thumb on them and admonish them and tell them how terrible they are. We encourage them. Notice this group the striving but struggling. They're categorized there in your text. Look back at it. They are called the faint-hearted. Really neat word. Uh, It's a compound word. It has on the front of it small or little. 
and squished together is soul. So small of soul or little souled. So he's saying if you find someone small of soul or metaphorically their soul is shrunk a bit, you've found someone that is striving but struggling. Why do I say striving but struggling? Because small of soul is speaking more to discouragement in the fight than it is speaking to resistance of living for the Lord. It's talking about a person, when you look at this word and chase it around the scriptures, that's humble, teachable, receptive. They just get easily discouraged in failure. Sometimes they lack the resolve when it gets difficult to walk with Christ. They get downcast. Many people believe this was the Thessalonians' problems under persecution. Some of them were struggling because they were seeing friends and family suffering and they were getting discouraged and small-souled and they were, they were starting to lose the resolve to fight. They were getting down. D. Edmund Hebert, one of my favorite commentators, here's what he thinks the small of soul best described. Listen to this. This will encourage some of you very much. This is a Christian with a deep consciousness of their own sinfulness, which causes them at times, to despair in their Christian life. (laughs) These are people that are striving but struggling and they've hit discouragement and they want to be in the fight. It doesn't necessarily mean they don't know the truth. They know the truth, but it's just hard to walk through trials. It's just hard to battle their sin. It's hard to be in friendships and relationships that are difficult. And over time, they just get weary. Is that not all of us some of the time? This is describing not just a categorical person. This is describing the ebb and flow of our Christianity. We may have areas where we are strong of soul and others where we are just weak. We get down. It's difficult. We don't come and admonish that person like they're stubborn or else we act like Job's friends. We don't want to be Job's friends. No, when we find the striving but struggling What does the text say to do? I love this. It says, encourage them. Parakaleo. It's where we get the word Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Parakaleo, literally, to come alongside and to call to them and encourage them and try and build them up. Build them up with what? Your opinions? The culture? Your hobbies? No. Build them up with truth. The idea is if you see a brother or sister down or discouraged, your job is to come alongside them and call out to them with truth to help their soul be lifted up. When I meet people that I see striving, they want to please Christ, they want to obey the Lord, they want to read their Bible, they want to pray, they want to live for him, but man, they just get down. They get small of soul. They feel like they're withering away sometimes under the press of life. I love to say to them passages like this with encouragement. For though the righteous fall seven times, they get back up, brother or sister. You can get up. You can rise up. You're in the Lord's army. He's given you his spirit. Though you fall seven times, you will rise. Proverbs 24, 16 is that verse. Or I like to take them to 1 John 5, 4. Whoever is born of God overcomes the world. Nikios, where we get our word Nike, conqueror. If you've been saved, you will overcome. How, we tell that brother, This is the victory, that you overcome the world by our faith. We need to encourage their faith. We need to fuel their beliefs with truth, with promises, with the character of God. When we see a brother or sister, small of soul, they need to meet with us with a joyful representative speaking to them on behalf of the Lord saying, can I just tell you how good God is? Can I tell you how faithful he is? And can I tell you some truths from the word of God to comfort you when you're down? Because you know these truths, but I'm gonna stir you up by way of reminder. You need to hear these again. I like to tell people Psalm 73, 23 to 26 when they're really down. The Lord says, I am continually with you. He will take hold of you by your right hand. Can you imagine that language of God the Father acting like we're a little kid just walking with us along, like a father walking their child? That's the imagery of God to the discouraged. He will counsel you. He will receive you to glory. And listen to this. Though your heart and your flesh fail, God is your strength, brother, sister. He's your portion. Do you know that when we come alongside people and admonish them, 
in sin, when we are not tolerant of sin, but intolerant of sin, and we love people, we are just like Jesus Christ. That's exactly what he did when he found people in sin. He loved them enough to tell them. And do you know as well, when we find people that are faint-hearted, that are discouraged, that are downcast, we're just like Jesus Christ when we come alongside them and encourage them with the truth to lift them up? Have you ever thought about Isaiah 42, verse 3 and Matthew 12, 20? It's that great language of Jesus Christ pre-incarnate in the Old Testament, Isaiah 42, and then in Matthew 12 in the New Testament. And you'll know the line when I say it. The bruised reed he will not snap, he will not break. The smoking wick he will not put out. So the idea is like a cattail that stands up, it gets bent in the middle and starts to fall down. When Jesus finds that person, he doesn't come up and go, snap, that's it, see? You have weakness, you have discouragement, I'm gonna snap you off and you're done. Or the smoking wick, like the fire that's barely burning, barely burning. Jesus doesn't come up and wet his fingers and go, Shh, that's it, see? You're not burning bright enough for me right now. I'm just gonna put you out. It says he will not snap that willow and he will not put out that fire. Rather, it says he will build them up. He will comfort them. He will come alongside them. Do you realize the faint-hearted person is the bruised reed? They're the smoking wick. We need to come on around them and give them truth so that that reed can stand upright with the word of God and that fire can burn again and that flame can come bright. And the fuel that burns that fire is the truth of God's word and the fortifying agent to stand that reed up is the word of God. We need friends that will love us when we are a bruised reed and a smoking wick. Now, I ask you again, when you talk about coming into a church and having it be a community, having it be a body, having it be sweet and encouraging and refreshing and enriching, how in the world could we actually walk alongside one another that way in lust we're spending time with one another talking about the truth, talking about our lives, talking about what's going on, talking about where we're growing, where we're discouraged, where we need help, where we need prayer. Sometimes churches are plagued, even with a strong pulpit, but weak fellowship. Why? Because from the pulpit down and the leaders down into the church, people are not coming alongside one another and ministering to each other with the word of God. It's missing fellowship. Therefore, it's missing the community that we want. The church is not a social club where we attach a couple Bible verses to it so we feel like it's a nice appendage and we feel Christian. The church is a place where we are in each other's lives with the word of God, letting the word of God move in and out of our hearts and sharing what's going on. And when we find a brother or sister, small of soul, that is our moment to be an instrument of Jesus Christ in their life. This is the kind of place where you want to go to church. This is why he said, I plead with you. I urge you. I beg of you. Brethren, consider Christian friendship and the comprehensive nature of being in one another's lives this way. You know what this takes? It takes time. It takes prayer. It takes effort. You can't be lazy in relationships and think you're going to get to a place where people are going to open up and share with you. We got to be in one another's lives. There needs to be space in our friendship to be able to talk about weaknesses, open about weaknesses, and then walk them through with the word of God. And it doesn't say well, I'm really down this week, so I need to go see the biblical counselor. Sure, there's times for that, but not this passage. This passage says, I'm really down this week, and I need a friend to be looking out for me and to come alongside me and minister to me the word of God. So that's what you do with the struggling, striving. That's what you do with the one who's striving and struggling. They are faint-hearted. So that's Two ways we minister and we care for the souls of our friends in body life. The first is when we find the unruly, the knowing but unwilling, what do we do? We admonish. Second, if we discern a friend is faint-hearted, striving but struggling, we encourage. What about the next one? The third way we care for our souls that are our friends in body life. If you discern a person is weak, you help them. If you discern a person is weak, you help them. I've called this person the willing but the weak. 
the willing but the weak. You say, how is the weak person different from the faint-hearted person? And that's an important question because we're called to encourage the discouraged, right? Uh, The the faint-hearted, and we're called to help the weak. And the language Paul is using is not passive language. To help literally is to cling to someone. It's to be devoted to someone. It's the idea of a long-term commitment to walk with someone. When he says, look at the text, when he says, help the weak, It quite literally means to clutch to them, to grab a hold of them, to come up under them where they're weak and help them walk until they become strong. It's language of devotion. So who are these weak people that need our clinging, clutching devotion? Well, here's how they're different than the faint-hearted. The faint-hearted are described in scripture. Those seem to be striving but struggling. They need truth, they need encouragement, but they're downcast that they're not living as faithfully as they'd like. The weak in scripture is actually speaking to people that are spiritually immature. Spiritually don't have the tools. There's areas of their life where they need the fundamentals. In fact, Paul uses this word for the weak in a number of contexts. It's not hard to discern its meaning when it starts to get worked out. The weak is the person in Romans 14 who's the weaker brother, whose conscience isn't informed. They're less spiritually mature. Matthew 26, 41, listen to this. It's the person, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So there's moral weakness. There's there's some desire there to do well. They're willing, but they lack resolve. They lack conviction. They lack teaching to actually walk by the spirit. Actually, the words used in Romans 5 to say we're helpless. When we were helpless, Christ died for us. And then 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about a member in the body of Christ that's vulnerable, that's weak. Vulnerable to what? Vulnerable to sin, vulnerable to false teaching, vulnerable to error. It's really, when you start to chase it out, it's a description of either a newer believer or someone that's been a believer a long time and just very poorly taught. We're talking about someone that is not just striving but struggling. They need someone to actually walk with them to help them work out and become strong where they're weak. You know what the Bible calls this? Discipleship. (laughs) We walk with people. We care for people. And guess what? You may have a friendship with someone where in one area you're weak and they're strong and they're walking with you and encouraging you. But in another area, they're strong and you're weak and vice versa. Weakness and strength get exchanged And so you get together, and in one area, they're helping you fortify biblical thinking. They're strengthening you. They're encouraging you. You're talking about the truth. You're asking them questions, and you realize they're strong where you're weak. And then the other way, you realize they have some areas of weakness, and they see it in you, and you start coming alongside them where you're strong and they're weak. You start ministering to them back and forth. We help the weak. We be a vital support. We cling to them. We hold on to them. We walk with them. This is biblical friendship, beloved. So I ask you again what I keep saying. This cannot be just a transaction. How in the world would you be able to discover where someone's weak or they would discover where you're weak if you don't spend time together? If you're not in a community, in relationships with one another? Paul is saying, I plead with you to walk with these people. Do you know why? Because when someone is weak, meaning they lack conviction and resolve, they're morally more vulnerable, they're doctrinally more vulnerable, do you know what the church is supposed to be? It's supposed to be a containing area where the walls are not theologically porous, where air is kept out and truth is put forward and they can grow and learn in an environment where they can be clung to and helped and raised up without all the junk from outside getting in to the teaching. So a church that's theologically porous in its walls, meaning air comes in, air goes out, truth comes in, it's pastor's preaching and pastor's opinion, it's psychology and the Bible, it's, you know, whatever cultural trend is there and the Bible. The weak person is the undiscerning. They're gonna latch onto that and it could lead them into air. The more weak someone is, the more important it is they're in a good church because the more vulnerable they are to be led into strange doctrine. And we're to be a place when we see the weak that we care for them. We cling to them. We walk with them. And you know what? 
I guarantee every strong Christian in this room, you can go back to the early days of your walk with Christ and someone walked with you when you were weak. Someone helped you, someone cared for you, someone ministered to you, someone taught you. Or even right now, if you're here and I'm like, I'm in the new believer category. Well, praise the Lord because we want to be a place that help the weak. We want to cling to you, walk with you, minister to you. Do you notice what he didn't say? He didn't say smush the weak, admonish the weak, step on the weak. He said help them. Help them with what? The word of God, the fundamentals, the basics. Help walk with them until they're strong enough to walk on their own. This is biblical friendship. This is biblical relationships. Why churches struggle to act like this is we allow the world's definition of friendships to infect and decay our biblical thinking rather than allowing God to define what makes sweet, abiding, fresh relationships and friendships. This is why Paul's pleading. He's pleading with them because he knows what's on the line is the very unity of the church. And so we're all here and we say, I want to be a part of a good church. I want to be a part of a healthy church. I want to be part of a a strong, abiding uh, body of believers. Well, I'm glad because guess what? You get to do your part because the text is to all of us. And to whatever strength the core of our church commits to this, that will be the sweetness of our relationships. Do you know what could ruin everything I said like that? If in the midst of admonishing our friends and helping them gently, if in the midst of coming alongside people that are striving but struggling, if in the midst of helping fortify the weak, If we become sinfully impatient, we could ruin all that. Which is why he summarizes the entire passage and soaks it and saturates it in a summary statement. Look at the text. In everything that I've told you to do, look at what it says. Be patient with everyone. It's the Greek word all. All what? All types of people, whatever season they're in, you be patient with them. Patient is the compound word with long on the front and suffer on the back. Suffer long with people. Walk with people. Care for people. Have room in your friendship dynamic for people to stumble and fall and then you help them along and pick them up. Have room in your friendship dynamic to be patient with someone even when you admonish them. If they don't respond well initially, you know how you respond sometimes not well. Give them time. Walk with them again. Patience, long suffering is to characterize our interactions with one another. You know where that word is most often used? How God treats us. Romans 2, 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness, his tolerance, and his patience with you? Not knowing that his kindness led you to repentance? How could we be impatient with other people in seasons where they're struggling and at the same time, in hypocrisy, sit and enjoy the patience of God with us in our weaknesses. This is why a church that's full of motive judging, uncharitable responses, harsh treatment of one another, shallow relationships, there's no room for the small souled to be cared for, no room for the unruly to come to repentance, and no room for the weak to be walked with because there's no charity in that ministry. There's no grace in that ministry. There's no kindness in that. Look, a healthy church ought to be literally immovable from the pulpit and the word of God. Intolerant of sin, intolerant of error, not backing down from a fight if it's a threat against the glory of the gospel. Literally, it ought to be clear that they, that pulpit, those leaders, they will not move from scripture. That should be clear. Who is that like? Jesus Christ. And then relationally, it ought to be characterized with that same commitment to truth, but patience with one another as we're learning it. (laughs) Charity and kindness towards one another as we're stumbling and working through things. Carefulness not to judge motives of people when they're working through stuff. Gentleness and admonishment knowing that you could easily be in sin. We ought to be characterized by that. Why? Who else was that like? Jesus Christ. When we act this way, 
We are instruments of Christ and his people. Our time's gone, but I thought of a couple implications that I thought might be good to just think through. So we think about that in church life, and we must. That's the primary context. But I thought about parenting and marriage. How are you doing? Being this way towards your spouse. I mean, I know it's easy to admonish. Boom, see it. See your sin. But how about when they're striving but struggling? Willing but weak. Do they get charity? Do they get help? Do they get encouragement? Or do we just have one mode, admonishment? How about our kids? Do our kids get patience? (laughs) Do they get long-suffering? Yes, when they're unruly, we should be intolerant of their sin and we should admonish them because of their sin. Your home should not be a place where sin is somehow treated casually. Christ is serious about sin. But when our kids kids are striving but struggling or willing but weak, do they get the same medicine as they do when they're unruly? Do they get the admonishment? Or do they get tender shepherding and help and care and we walk with them? You want to nurture interdependence in a home life where relationships have room for people to have weakness and talk through those things so you can grow together. So this passage could be applied there. Second implication. You might ask, can someone be all of these at the same time? Because I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, I'm kind of unruly sometimes. I'm kind of faint-hearted sometimes. I'm kind of weak sometimes. I feel like I'm the whole thing, pastor. Of course you are. We all are somewhere. We just don't want to be categorically unruly. (laughs) But sure, we're a mixed bag. This is why we need friends in our life walking with us and us walking with them. So whatever season we're weaving out of, they can have wisdom to walk with us and us with them. Because we're a mixed bag. Of course we are. One more implication. Some of you are out here saying, I just can't do this. Like what you described there, that kind of relational dynamic, that makes my skin crawl. And I don't think I'm prepared for it. I don't think I'm ready for it. Let me read you a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer about your readiness to minister to others. The most experienced psychologist or observer of human nature knows infinitely less of the human heart than the simplest Christian who lives beneath the cross of Jesus. The greatest psychological insight, ability, and experience cannot grasp one thing, what sin is. Worldly wisdom knows what distress and weakness and failures are, but it does not know the godlessness of man. And so it also does not know that man is destroyed only by sin and can be healed only by forgiveness. Listen to this, beloved. Only the Christian knows this. In the presence of the psychiatrist, I can only be a sick man. In the presence of a Christian brother, I can dare to be a sinner. The psychiatrist must first search my heart, and yet he never plums its ultimate depth. The Christian brother knows when I come to him, here is a sinner like me. The psychiatrist views me as if there was no God. The brother views me as I am before the judging and merciful God under the cross of Jesus Christ. Wow. If you're a Christian, of course you can do this. If you're not a Christian and you don't have the spirit in your life, this passage is like the sweetest offering because everything I just said believers are for each other is what Christ offers you in the gospel. Think about it. He offers you forgiveness from your sin after he exposes your sin to you. He offers you that he'll walk with you when you're discouraged. He offers you that he'll equip you by his word and his people when you're weak. Turning from your sin and putting your faith in Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, and believing in him by faith, this is what you get. You not only get that from Christ, but guess what? You get the church. You get a whole bunch of friends that'll walk with you. And that's like the greatest offering in the world. So Paul urges these believers, and I'll read the text, and we'll be done. Look at what we were just exhorted to do. 1 Thess 5.14. Look at it with me. We urge you, brethren, admonish 
We'll put our language in there. Your friends when they become unruly. Encourage your friends when they're faint-hearted. And help your friends when they're weak. And in all of it, be long-suffering with people because that is when you're like Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this passage. It was such a sweet ministry to my heart. I pray, pray, Lord, that our church would be characterized by all of these areas and patience. Oh, how patient you are with us. Every single day, your mercy and your patience towards us in light of our sin and what we deserve is so beyond charitable, gracious, kind. Lord, if this church is known for anything, Lord, please let it be known for being like you. Immovable on truth, but absolutely patient with people and their weaknesses. And we pray you'd bless the relationships in our church, bless the friendships, help us repent of spiritual laziness in friendships and be in one another's lives. Not let our past characterize who we are in the present, but walk in newness of life. We love you so much, Lord. Bless our last song as we sing to you in your name. Amen.